In the beginning, there was nothing but water and ice and a narrow strip of shoreline, goes a Native American legend. Nine thousand years ago in North America was a time when tribes of hunter-gatherers roamed the continent, armed with sharpened spears and the bow and arrow, living on the edge and looking for a kill. These were the last of the megafauna hunters. With the warming of the planet came the extinction of the great beasts and their way of life. When the nearly complete skeleton of an ancient man was discovered along the Columbia River in Washington State, the scientific world was thrown into turmoil. Dubbed the Ancient One by Native American tribes, his bones challenged everything anthologists thought they knew about the peopling of the Americas. Genetic studies prove he was closely related to Native Americans who still live in the area where he was found, but many mysteries remained. Now, genetic studies may have pinned down his childhood home and where his ancestors came from. It was the deeper look at his DNA, particularly his haplogroups, that offered the real story. And it's a story that links him not to far-off continents, but to the stormy coasts and ancient peoples of the Pacific, Northwest and Alaska, including the tribes of Vancouver Island. So the question must be asked, did his genetic ancestry point towards something more complex? An ancient wave of seafaring people who settled the continent before the ancestors of the eastern tribes arrived? Why was there an arrowhead embedded in his hip? Was it from tribal warfare as tribes fought and expanded into new territories as sea levels rose, the climate warmed, and megafauna died off? The Ancient One carried two key genetic signatures. Mitochondrial haplogroup X2A passed through the maternal line, and Y-chromosome haplogroup QM3 passed through the paternal. Both are deeply rooted in Native American lineages. But what makes his case so fascinating is not the genetic labels themselves, but the story they tell when traced backward, through geography, migration, and even myth. This is a story that takes us beyond ice sheets and Clovis points, out to the sea, into the forests of Vancouver Island, and through the glacier-etched memories of the Bella Bella tribe. It asks us to rethink what it means to be Native American, and who the ancestors of the first Americans truly were. The Ancient One's maternal haplogroup, X2A, is an enigma. It is found exclusively in Native Americans, particularly among tribes of the Great Lakes and Pacific Northwest, yet it is absent from Siberia. A puzzling fact, if all Native Americans descended from explorers who crossed Beringia. Unlike other founding haplogroups such as A, B, C, and D, which have clear roots in East Asia, X2A has no parent clade in modern Siberian populations. Instead, the closest relatives of haplogroup X2A are X2B and X2C, which are found in the Basques of Spain and the Druze of Syria. This has led to speculation that X2A came from West Eurasia. But science offers a more nuanced picture, suggesting that haplogroup X originated in central Eurasia and some carriers migrated west to Europe and some went east to the Americas. Either way, carriers of haplogroup X do have a direct blood relationship with one another, even if it is 20,000 years distant. The Ancient One's version of X2A is deeply basal, meaning it sits close to the root of the branch that would later radiate into known subclades X2A1 and X2A2. His genome dates to 8,500 years ago, yet the divergence point for X2A is far older, perhaps 15,000 to 20,000 years ago. That places the origin of this lineage near the time when the first humans reached the Americas via the Pacific coast, not the interior. In fact, the discovery that the Ancient One carried a basal form of X2A, lacking the defining mutations of X2A1 and X2A2, finally anchored this lineage in deep time on the Pacific Northwest coast. This place is the root of X2, a long before the diversification seen in tribes of the Great Lakes or Central Canada over 9,000 years ago, possibly as early as 13,000 to 15,000 years ago, when the first humans were settling the Americas along the deglaciated shoreline. A basal lineage means that his X2A represents an early unmutated form, close to the original founding X2A that entered the Americas, presumably through Beringia. Unlike his genetic descendants, the Ancient One shows none of the branching mutations that define modern tribal lineages, 
suggesting that he lived closer in time to the migration bottleneck only a few thousand years after X2A emerged from its ancestral route. This early form of X2A took route along the coastal migration route, carried by small groups of seafaring hunter-gatherers. These people moved rapidly, following the rich kelp forests and ocean currents that ran from Alaska down the Pacific coast, a highway of life that connected glacier-free refugia and allowed early populations to flourish where inland ice made travel impossible. So where exactly did haplogroup X2A come from? The most likely explanation is that it evolved from an ancestral X2 population that had spread across northern Eurasia before the last glacial maximum. A small branch moved eastward, isolated in Beringia or coastal refugia, where it gave rise to X2A. As ice sheets melted, its carriers migrated south along the Pacific coast and inland to the Great Lakes, where its highest modern frequencies are now found. Today, haplogroup X2A and its daughter lineages live on in Native American women, particularly X2A1 in the Ojibwe Sioux and Navajo, and X2A2 in the Nucha, Nulth and Maka of Vancouver Island and Washington State, and some Algonquian-speaking peoples and scattered populations in the Plains and Southwest. The Nucha, Nulth tribe in particular are direct inheritors of the man's maternal legacy. Their culture is rooted in the Pacific, with ancient whaling traditions, deep-water canoes, and seasonal migrations that would have mirrored the movements of early coastal peoples. They are a seafaring people, and their DNA speaks of a deep-time connection to a Pacific migration route, one that dates to the terminal Pleistocene. The Ancient One's remains were discovered in Yakima Territory, in present-day Washington State, along the Columbia River. The Yakima Nation, part of the Sahaptin-speaking peoples of the Columbia Plateau, has always maintained that he is their ancestor, and modern genomic analysis supports this assertion. When genome-wide comparisons were made between his DNA and living Native American groups, the closest match was with members of the Colville tribe, another interior Salish group whose territory overlaps with that of the Yakima. Both tribes, like the Nez Perce, Umatilla and Wasco, have cultural and ancestral ties to the Columbia River Corridor, a region deeply embedded in the network of ancient coastal and riverine migrations. While the Yakima are not maritime today, their ancestors would have interacted with and shared genes with the coastal peoples, including those of Vancouver Island, Haida Gwaii, and the northern shores of British Columbia, where X2A1 lineages would later appear. On the paternal side, he carried haplogroup QM3, the dominant Y chromosome lineage found in Native American men. QM3 likely evolved in Beringia around 15,000 to 18,000 years ago, soon after the founding population split from its Siberian ancestors. It is found today throughout the Americas, from the Inuit of the Arctic to the Aymara of the Andes. Haplogroup QM3's presence in coastal South American tribes, such as the Chono and Yamana of Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego, supports the idea of an early maritime migration down the coast. These groups, like the Haida and Nucha North of the North, depended on boats, seals and sea lions. They reflect not only genetic continuity, but technological parallels, suggesting a shared seafaring legacy that dates to the initial colonization of the New World, the Ancient One, buried in the heart of the Columbia River Basin, carried both the maternal and paternal signatures of this ancient migration. He was not an inland forager, who came later from the ice-free corridor. He was a mariner's descendant, a relic of the coast, a product of ancient voyages. How did the man's ancestors reach the Americas? Increasing evidence points to a deliberate and coordinated coastal migration route, the so-called Kelp Highway, used by early seafarers moving along the edge of the Pacific Rim. From Japan to Kamchatka, down the Aleutians and into the Americas, this path would have offered rich marine resources, relatively ice-free shorelines, and ample islands for navigation. About 8,500 years ago, North America experienced a period of warming known as the Holocene Thermal Maximum, with some regions becoming significantly warmer than today. This warming was accompanied by shifts in precipitation patterns and vegetation, including the expansion of forests and the melting of glaciers, 
leading to changes in water levels and river systems and rising sea levels, which may have displaced people living on the coast. The story of Haplogroup X2A and the Ancient One cannot be told without returning to the Pacific, not as a barrier, but as a corridor. Long before the interior ice sheets opened paths into the Americas, the sea offered a highway lined with islands, kelp forests, and marine life. Though no early boats have been recovered, the archaeological and ethnographic evidence for a Pleistocene maritime migration is both circumstantial and compelling. Some anthropologists argue that the Pacific coast was colonized before 23,000 years ago, in part because watercraft were already in use in Japan before that time. Even earlier, offshore fishing technologies appear in Indonesia between 35,000 and 40,000 years ago, strongly implying regular water travel. The region from the Philippines through the Ryukyu Islands to Japan, a mosaic of islands and narrow channels, served as a training ground for early humans learning to sail and paddle the sea. From there, it is plausible that they moved northward along the Kuril Islands, when improved ocean productivity and expanding kelp ecosystems may have lured people along the rim of the Pacific. Even if boats made of wood or hide haven't survived due to waterlogged preservation conditions and inundated coastal sites, their presence is inferred from island archaeology, stone tools and bones on offshore islands that could only have been reached by boat. And while science reads the sediments and radiocarbon dates, First Nations oral traditions have long held the memory of what the land and sea once were. As stated in the introduction, one of the most evocative pieces of anecdotal evidence comes from the Bella Bella, or Heiltsuk tribe, oral tradition, recorded by Franz Boas in 1898. As one elder told him, in the beginning there was nothing but water and ice and a narrow strip of shoreline. This line, handed down through generations, may encode a memory of the last deglaciation, when retreating glaciers exposed just a sliver of land between towering ice walls and the pounding sea. The Heiltsuk territory along the central coast of British Columbia, rich with fjords and uplifted beaches, was one of the first regions to emerge from under the ice, and one of the first to be reoccupied. Stories like these may preserve folk memories of a landscape in flux, the liminal world of the terminal Pleistocene, where people clung to narrow shorelines while watching both the glaciers retreat and the forests return. The Heiltsuk are a maritime people. Their lives revolve around canoes, whales, sea otters, and salmon. Like the Nucha Nult and Haida, their deep cultural memory recalls a time when the sea met the ice, when migrations were not through inland passes but along rocky, icy coastlines. Their mythology does not separate the human and the natural. It links them through ancestral stories that still echo the shape of post-glacial landscapes. The Nucha Nult, Heiltsuk, Tlingit, and other coastal nations of British Columbia and Alaska are not merely descendants of ancient people, they are heirs to a seafaring legacy that predates the Neolithic. Their carved cedar canoes, some capable of holding twenty people, mirror the kind of vessels used by their Pleistocene ancestors. Whaling ceremonies, seasonal ocean migrations, and oral records of glacial ice-meeting saltwater all preserve a worldview shaped by the sea. Their DNA matches their stories. The presence of X2A2 and QM3 in these tribes reflects both maternal and paternal continuity with early coastal populations. The Ancient One may have died inland, but his ancestors almost certainly came from the coast. He belongs not only to the Columbia River, but to the greater Pacific. He was part of a coastal seafaring people, descending from explorers who skirted the edge of the Ice Age world in boats. His haplogroups, X2A and QM3, are not foreign anomalies. They are indigenous signatures, still found today in the tribes of the Pacific Northwest and the Great Lakes. He was not just an isolated skeleton. He was a son of the Kelp Highway, a whisper of the glacier's edge, and a bearer of a story written in both bone and myth. The question is no longer whether he was a Native American or First American or American Indian, but he was here 9,000 years ago, and that is long enough to be called native.